Before we start this video, I just want to give you a heads up that there will obviously be spoilers for Assassin's Creed 2. I'd also like to thank our gold tier patrons AB, Christopher, Cypress Husky, Frank Riff, Ghostly Gaming, Hutch Puppy, Lucas, and Pyrite. Thanks so much, and I hope you enjoy the video. Assassin's Creed is one of the most prominent series of games in my life. Since the release of Assassin's Creed 2, I was totally on board with the franchise and purchased every new release when it came out. I loved seeing Ezio's journey come to a close in Revelations. I loved pillaging ships and discovering treasure in Black Flag. I loved Unity's improved stealth, combat, and parkour, and the game was absolute eye candy. I even enjoyed the complete shift to a more RPG-heavy game that Origins and Odyssey took. Assassin's Creed 2, however, well, I don't really like Assassin's Creed 2. Of course, a great deal can be said for the way Assassin's Creed 2 improved on the first game as it clearly refined the mechanics of Assassin's Creed 1 and by all means serves as a good sequel. The graphics are great for the time and even to this day still look pretty good and the world and costume design are arguably top notch. However, the game definitely has its flaws which made it an ultimately unenjoyable experience for me. I found that Assassin's Creed 2's gameplay was quite dull and even lacking in some cases. The stealth was borderline non-existent and whatever semblance of stealth there was isn't fleshed out or even given to the player all the time. The combat felt repetitive and I got a sense I'd seen just about everything the combat had to offer by the end of the first few missions. The parkour, while ambitious, is quite janky and jank is one of my biggest issues with the game. Having to restart missions and being detected by enemies across the map was ultimately the cherry on top for my mind-numbing replay of this game. Drawn out sequences, bugs, and a myriad of other things left me feeling like this game was a trip down memory lane that I would never go down again. Now before I get into my reasoning behind such controversial statements, I need to clarify a few things, and I implore you to not skip this part of the video as it's vital context. Firstly, I don't think Assassin's Creed 2 is a bad game by any means, in fact I'd say it's a good game, but it's just not for me. Secondly, just because I don't like this game does not mean that I think you're stupid if you do like it. If you like this game, that is totally fine, and I don't think my taste is better than yours. There's no sense of superiority here, and I don't want this video to come across as antagonistic or an aggressive attack against those who like the game, but rather a defense of my own opinion. Third, if I say that I'm not a fan of, for example, the story of this game, that does not mean that I like the other game's stories. Some of you seem to think that because I enjoyed Odyssey, I only want Spartan kicks and RPG elements in video games, which just isn't true. Fourth, I'm going to again request that we please be civil in the comments. If you disagree and want to say why you like the game, then by all means do so. I'm open to having a discussion, I'm totally open to having my mind changed. However, if you start a comment by saying, okay idiot, let me show you why your taste is bland and that you have no idea what an Assassin's Creed game is all about, then I probably just won't read it. Finally, I'll be looking at this game in a vacuum of sorts to prevent it from turning into a huge comparison to the other games and to keep this video from being way too long. Okay, now with that out of the way we can move forward and hopefully have a respectful and civil discussion and of course, this is all my opinion. Anything I criticize is not me saying that something is objectively bad. Finally, I want to clarify that the opinion I am about to present and attempt to justify is coming from a self-proclaimed fan of the franchise. I've played almost every mainline game in the franchise with the exception of Origins and Rogue. I have at least purchased both of those games, I'm about two hours into Origins but I'm too busy to get to those yet but I plan to. As far as the Ezio games, I have 100% completed all of the Ezio games and on top of that I've also 100% completed Unity and Syndicate. So I feel like I'm quite familiar with the series at this point and I've been playing the games for years now. One of the first things I need to mention is that this game is definitely old by now. Coming out in late 2009, I of course won't criticize things like graphics as they are more than likely a product of the times, and criticizing it now would be a little ridiculous. The graphics in this game obviously are not top of the line for today's standards, but surprisingly the overall presentation still holds up. Don't get me wrong, there are still some character models that look a little funny to say the least, but damn if this game isn't pretty. The costume and world design in particular looks spectacular, and it's clear that a lot of time and effort went into designing the character models, the buildings, the weapons, and it all comes together to form a product that on the surface is still kind to the eyes. Furthering this is the UI, which has a slick modern design to it which reminds you that you are still within the Animus. Cutscenes still look great and the lip syncing is overall pretty good. Voice acting itself is good too, and I never heard any lines that stood out to me for being either poorly delivered or written. Animations for this game still look pretty good too, with combat animations looking brutal and these combat animations have quite a bit of variety too, ranging from the takedowns to your fists to the much faster dagger swipes. The buildings have some unique designs, however there are a few cases of building assets and even entire buildings things being copy and pasted, such as this building here in Venice and this near identical building in Florence. Fortunately, you don't usually notice these things while playing the game as you're always running, jumping, and climbing your way to the next objective. The parkour is another aspect of the game that still holds up pretty well. Of course, when comparing it to games like Unity, the difference for me is night and day, but it still functions most of the time. My biggest issue with the parkour is its lack of flow. There's often a lot of stop and go to the animations and climbing and it can feel pretty sluggish at times. 
Sometimes you just get into a flow of reaching and lifting yourself brick by brick, but this doesn't happen too often and the animations for getting up here got quite old as it's the same reaching animation over and over. When the different animations do play, it unfortunately results in that stop and go that I mentioned earlier. This game also followed the series trend of it being faster to get somewhere on the ground than it is to use your parkour abilities. On top of that, it's usually safer to stick to the ground too, as when you're in the later stages such as Venice, the buildings are high enough that a fall could be fatal. Still, I think the fact that you can climb basically every surface in the game is still incredible even if it is rough around the edges. Within the context of the time of this game's release, I don't think any other game had a free running system with this much depth and even to this day, few of them do. I think for the time it was a little too ambitious but it's ultimately a thing I really enjoyed about the game. I really enjoyed the renovations that could be made to the villa. I know it seems a little dumb but I enjoyed having a constant source of income and actually seeing the individual changes made to the many shops. I know it's totally a pointless aspect of the game, but I thought it was just pretty enjoyable as it gave you something to put your money towards once you bought all the weapons and armor you needed. So I guess I should stop beating around the bush and talk about the things I don't like. Let's start with the combat. The combat while being reasonably fun for the first few hours gets quite old quite quickly. You have a myriad of abilities to choose from ranging from a basic attack, a counter, and a grab. When trying to execute a counter, waiting for a guard to strike may take some time, so instead of waiting you can taunt the enemy which will force an attack from them. There are even different enemy types within the game, being the basic soldier, the more nimble and agile soldier, the armored standard soldier, and the beefy super armored soldier. The nimble enemies attack faster than the normal enemies and are the only enemy type that can actually outrun Ezio. They can quickly dodge a lot of your attacks, but they lack armor, meaning that it won't take long to finish them off. The typical enemy and the armored ones can be taken down in the same way, however the armored ones have the ability to parry some of your attacks. The beefier ones are slowest but do the most damage and take the most damage too. While it may seem nice to have a variety of different enemy types, they all unfortunately are taken down the same way, be that through wailing on them with your sword by mashing X or by counter killing them. I found that in the beginning of the game, most of the enemies can be killed with a single counter. However, this quickly turned the game into wait and press a single button. Sure, you could attack the enemies, but it never did as much damage as an instant kill counter did. The later stages present beefier enemies that only take a square or two of damage when being countered, and the bosses are a mash X marathon. These beefier enemies can't be taken out by countering with your sword or dagger, but instead switching to your fist where you can disarm an enemy upon countering them. Upon disarming and equipping their weapon, you can immediately press X to instantly kill them with their own weapon. You could also throw a smoke bomb or use poison, but the disarm and counter method was my go-to. The bosses in the game are the beefiest of health sponges and I found them to be quite boring for the most part. The bosses function the exact same as a normal enemy with the only difference being their massive health bars. This led to boss fights being uninteresting as they didn't change anything compared to the basic minute to minute gameplay. They could have designed the bosses differently to make them more engaging for the player. Maybe they could program a boss that swings his sword multiple times and you would have to counter their attacks one after the other and if you don't counter or get the timing wrong, you would take a hit. Rodrigo Borgia specifically was a boss fight that felt not only underwhelming but far too easy. The overall lack of difficulty with the combat is easily my biggest issue. There are two particular abilities or methods of killing that I've left out, those being the instant kill combo and the hidden blade counters. Firstly, when attacking an enemy, an enemy may parry your attack. If this happens and you immediately tap the attack button upon seeing the parry animation, then you will kill the enemy. This method is never explained to you in-game, and if it is, then miraculously both myself and Nam12399 have missed it. While it may seem like this adds quite a lot of depth to the game, it unfortunately can be performed by just mashing square, and hence, it's not very difficult. The hidden blades on the other hand are absolutely broken in this game. It can counter any enemy. Now the window that you have to counter an enemy is much shorter than that of a sword or a dagger, but it's still so large that it ultimately makes the game way too easy. I even went out of my way to play the game without using the hidden blades or any armor until I received the armor of Altair. Even when taking the game's difficulty into my own hands, I found the game was brutally easy, and having abilities such as a hidden blade counter and instant kill combo on top of the armor of Altair which grows your health bar to where it takes up half the screen doesn't really help with the difficulty. What you see in the first hour of the game is essentially what you get when it comes to the combat. While there are some different mechanics such as dodging, strafing, throwing dirt at the enemy, grabbing and using projectiles, all of them are introduced quite early and all are rarely effective. I'm not going to sit here and claim that the game should have combat that changes or evolves as the game progresses. That is a difficult task for any game, especially one that isn't necessarily combat centric. However, I feel it is unfair to criticize some of the more recent games in the franchise for having repetitive combat while ignoring that same issue which is present in this game. I don't believe that the combat being shallow or repetitive is strictly a matter of technology. 
Other games that have come out at the time have had combat much more enjoyable and have had combat systems with many deeper layers to them. The first to come to mind, a game that was released a few months before Assassin's Creed 2, would be Demon Souls. I could very easily go on about the combat and the depth of the combat, but I'd rather not go on too much of a tangent. Devil May Cry 4 also has quite a deep and complex combat system and that game came out in 2008, a year before Assassin's Creed 2. The point of this comparison is not to say that these games are better than Assassin's Creed 2, but to say that the technology and the ability to create a combat system with depth was there for the time period, and for me, I'm not seeing it here. I feel the need to make this point because a common rebuttal I've seen to pretty much any criticism of this game, including the combat, is, well of course the combat isn't deep, it's 11 years old. Now, of course, I don't expect the game to have Devil May Cry levels of depth within the combat and I think it would be ridiculous to expect such from a game, however, I think the combat we got here is severely lacking. I understand that DMC's gameplay also steps outside of realism quite a lot, and I'm not saying that I want Assassin's Creed 2 to be like that, but the point I'm trying to make is that the ability to create a deep combat system was there. Now my own assumptions when playing the game as to why the combat felt so dull and overall boring was because you weren't really meant to use it. I mean, being an assassin is all about being a stealth badass who lurks in the shadows only to cut through enemies when they least expect it, right? Right? <sighs> the stealth in this game really confuses me. The game takes a different spin on the typical stealth you would see in something like Metal Gear Solid. Instead of sticking to the shadows, the game encourages you to hide in plain sight, which is really awesome. There are different groups that you can hire, and you can order them to either follow you, allowing you to blend in with the crowd, or order them to distract guards. You can sit on a bench to go invisible to guards, or hide in the many haystacks littered throughout ancient Italy. One of my issues with this system, however, is that it's never expanded upon. The game teaches you very early on how to order courtesans around, and how to use them to distract guards or blend in, and that's all it is. There really isn't any depth past that. It would have been cool if there were some guards that were giga chads and wouldn't be so easily distracted by those pesky knockers. These special guards would have to be distracted in some other way through the use of thieves or mercenaries. Unfortunately, the south segments of the game can be very quickly boiled down to just finding the nearest faction. Don't get me wrong, the first few times it can instill a great sense of satisfaction, but you quickly realize that that is always the easiest and in some cases the only option. I don't necessarily have an issue with the system itself, but more in the way that it's used, or in this case, the way it's not used. It often felt like an easy win to any mission. Many of the tailing missions saw me exclusively sticking to the courtesans, and when these tailing portions are upwards of 6 minutes, it became pretty boring for me. As far as systems like the benches and the haystacks littered around, I don't believe that they should be expanded upon as they work perfectly fine the way they are and they work pretty well within the game's design. Since we're on the topic of design, we should talk about the enemy detection because it's actually pretty decent, sort of. The enemies detect you at a reasonable rate, and obviously once you get in their face they'll detect you, however an issue with this is that when killing an enemy from above for example, you'll kill him right on what feels like the exact frame in which he detects you. When there is a mission that requires you to not be detected, this single split second in which the enemy has detected you will cause you to fail. The later levels in the game really exemplify how brutal the stealth can be as you're almost always just walking up to guards to stab them because running makes too much noise or using the throwing knives. Throwing knives, however, do little to no damage until you upgrade them through training at the villa. Unfortunately, training at the villa isn't something you were encouraged to do, so this led to a lot of players, including myself, feeling quite frustrated. The knives, much like any other resource like the smoke bombs, are unfortunately finite, however you can always buy more or loot some off of dead bodies. This is eventually remedied through the purchase of upgrades to your knife belt, allowing you to carry in excess of knives for whatever mission you're on. Unfortunately, this leads to many missions in which taking out guards is unnecessarily difficult if you don't have the knife upgrades, but if you do, then it becomes a matter of tapping X when you see an enemy. What confuses me the most about the stealth in this game is the way it completely ignores the basics of a stealth system while having levels that feel like they were made for a game that has the fundamentals of a stealth game. I wonder why the game doesn't have a crouch button or at least a cover system. I feel like it would help immensely with some of the stealth portions of this game. The reason I say this is because there are some missions such as Sequence 8 Memory 5 which see you storming the fort using Leonardo da Vinci's flying machine. While the flying machine was a blast of a set piece to play through, the end of the level stumbles quite hard. You have to either spam knives or carefully walk around the guard's cones of vision in order to not be seen. A typical strategy of paying the courtesans here won't work as they, surprisingly enough, don't operate well on high rises. The issues with the enemies detecting you immediately if performing any assassination aside from the walking assassination is unfortunately present here. I feel like this mission would be greatly improved upon if Ezio could quickly snap to a wall or at least crouch making him harder to detect. I know it sounds like such a simple change, but it would help greatly for the many missions this game has to offer. 
in the many tailing missions within the game, there are multiple times where whoever you are tracking will turn around out of suspicion. Obviously, quickly sitting on a bench or finding a crowd would be your first option if you weren't already there, but would it not also make sense to quickly press circle, for example, to scurry behind a wall or some barrels? There's only one real saving grace when it comes to the stealth, and that is easily the gun. The wrist mounted gun is an upgrade given to you about halfway through the game and is the ultimate cheese weapon. There were so many missions where I was supposed to assassinate someone only for it to be completed in seconds by locking on and pulling the trigger. Take this objective in sequence 9 memory 8, where you have to assassinate a target on a boat. This place is heavily guarded, and just about every one of those guards is armed to the teeth. I'm actually not sure what you're supposed to do here, maybe you are supposed to run up and take him out before he enters the captain's quarters, but who knows cause I just sniped his ass from a group of courtesans. I assume you're supposed to stab him as the cutscene that plays upon assassinating him shows Ezio close to him as if he was stabbed. This and countless other missions were made to be a cakewalk by using the gun, but damn if it wasn't a lot more fun than fiddling with the detection system until it worked in my favor. I mean hell, by the time I was in sequence 13, I had guards detecting me from across the map. It was also certainly a lot more appealing than spamming smoke bombs. Speaking of sequence 13, in sequence 13 memory 8, there's a Templar in an open field surrounded by guards, and being detected causes you to instantly fail the mission. I couldn't figure out a way to kill him without the gun, and trying to take out any of the guards overseeing the field resulted in a quick desynchronization. Missions like this one and frankly a lot of the missions in sequence 13 felt brutally counterintuitive. Such as sequence 13 memory 6, where there is a Templar on a boat and he is sitting right at the door to the captain's quarters and of course, getting caught will result in an instant failure. You can't snipe him as he's covered by the sides of the entrance and the many guards. You can't use courtesans as there are far too many guards around and they would quickly be depleted. Your best bet from what I've seen online is to try and spam smoke bombs while making your way to the Templar, or in my case get extremely lucky in that I was able to run up and stab him just as I got detected. So I feel I should again bring up this point just to cover all bases, but the stealth mechanics in the game, or rather the lack of said mechanics, are not a product of the game's time. I could of course bring up examples such as Metal Gear Solid, but why not look at a game within Ubisoft Montreal? Ubisoft Montreal developed Assassin's Creed 2. Ubisoft Montreal also developed Splinter Cell Chaos Theory. Chaos Theory came out nearly 4 years before Assassin's Creed 2 in 2005. In Chaos Theory there is a crouch mechanic, a cover system, a sound and lighting detection system, and these could be considered the absolute basics when it comes to designing a game around stealth, however, only a sound based detection system is present in Assassin's Creed 2, and it's nowhere near as deep as it is in Splinter Cell Chaos Theory. So not only was the technology and the resources necessary available, it was available within the company. So I personally believe that saying the game is old and the technology wasn't there doesn't apply here, as it's clear that the game is designed as if those mechanics were there. So since we've now talked about both stealth and combat, I feel like I can properly make the next statement about the different abilities and mechanics of the game. I feel like Assassin's Creed 2 has a lot of mechanics and abilities for you to use, but there are a small selection of those mechanics and abilities that are exponentially more efficient and effective, rendering all the other options near pointless. When it comes to the combat, what's the point in buying or even using the different weapons in the game if the hidden blade from the moment you get it will instantly counter kill any enemy? What's the point of investing in the armor for the game if you don't really need it? What's the point of learning the different combat moves and abilities from the villa if the hidden blades do the job perfectly well? What's the point of using throwing knives if courtesans work better? And by the time you get to a mission where you can't use said courtesans, you have the gun, which serves as an instant win. You have so many tools for the job, but only a few of them are worth using while the others are, for what? People wanting an extra challenge? That's what I had initially thought. I thought, okay, I won't use the hidden blades to instant kill in order to make the game more fun for myself. That way I won't get bored during combat. Well, using the sword is essentially the same thing, but it's much slower. I'm still countering enemies and waiting for them to attack, except now I'm doing it more and with a larger counter window. At least the different animations for the different styles of weapons made using a sword or a dagger somewhat interesting, but that interest wore off after less than an hour. It's like bringing an entire toolbox to screw in a nut. You just need the wrench. I mean sure, you can try and do it with the screwdriver and hell, maybe you could actually pull it off. However, the screwdriver wasn't designed for it. Social stealth wasn't designed for these levels where you have to sneak onto a boat or somehow get past a small army of guards protecting a Templar in an open field, and the basic stealth mechanics that are in the game just simply aren't refined enough. So I think I've spoken enough about the mechanics of the game, and I'd like to take some time to talk about the actual missions in the game, and go over some of the sequences. A common claim that I've heard throughout the community is that Assassin's Creed 2 is an awesome game because every mission was different and left an impression on the player. 
I have to completely disagree with this, as a majority of the game is what seems to be a rotation of three different objectives. Go here, kill X, go here, protect X, and go here, grab X. There are a few missions that break this mold, such as the missions with the flying machine, but all the missions blend together so much. I actually didn't mind the basic mission structure, but I did feel like the end of the game was drawn out to a crawl. The biggest examples of padding are the codex pages and the entirety of sequence 13. The codex pages are collectible that can be nabbed throughout your journey through ancient Italy, and they can be brought to Leonardo da Vinci to increase your maximum health. The codex pages are also required to progress to sequence 14. Now the game does tell you that the codex pages will be needed to access later memories, but a majority of players including myself and a few friends found that they didn't have enough by the time that they were required, and grabbing them was a huge pain. The only redeeming quality is that they do mark them on your map once you synchronize a viewpoint, and if for some reason you don't have all viewpoints synchronized, then they will show up on your map, but getting them felt a little unnecessary for me. Unfortunately, they also don't mark these on your map until you get to the room where sequence 14 takes place. This meant going to the mission and literally having a wall and a text that says, ah ah ah, not yet. I can understand if this wasn't an issue for you guys, but for me, it really rubbed me the wrong way. Sequence 13, on the other hand, is so blatantly filler. Nearly the entire sequence is filled with missions that are akin to that of many assassination side missions in the game, and a large number of them will cause you to desynchronize upon being detected. Like some that I've mentioned earlier, such as the Templar on a boat, or the one in a field, a majority of these missions feel counterintuitive, and because of how easily they can be cheesed with the gun, it felt like an hour and a half of busy work. By the time you do get to this point of the game, you've already performed multiple assassinations in a myriad of different ways, and that's assuming you didn't bother with the bundles of assassination contracts, which are available quite early on. These missions don't offer anything new for you to do in the sense of getting to or taking down the enemy, and the only thing the missions in this sequence do that the side quests don't is upping the enemy count to a limiting degree. Due to the amount of enemies present in such a condensed mission area, there were few and sometimes only one place and route for you to take to your target, because if you step outside those routes you were spotted and subsequently detected quite fast. I wish they had left more gaps for the player to work with. Maybe during the mission where you have to assassinate the doctor, they could leave a gap in the guards that are guarding the doctor, making it easier to sneak between the guards and slip them the old sleeping medication. I figure before we get into the story, I should mention the bugs that showed up in my game. I know that bugs are a tough thing to cover since each player will experience different bugs on each playthrough, and some people might experience a ton of bugs and some might experience none at all. I however found that I ran into quite a few, some of which leaving me giggling like a little child, and some that forced me to desynchronize. There was a specific mission within Sequence 5 Memory 4 where a preacher needs to be assassinated on top of a tower. After getting up to the tower and taking out the guards, I realized that my target was nowhere to be found. I had to jump off and desynchronize myself as there isn't a reload to the last checkpoint feature in the main menu. In other news, there was quite a hilarious bug during Sequence 10 Memory 1, and I'll just let you watch this one. So I actually don't want to criticize the game for bugs like this because it 110% did not affect my experience, though I thought I'd mention it because it was pretty funny. Another bug that was definitely swinging more towards frustration than humor was during sequence 13. I was being detected by groups from across the map, through walls, or even through entire city blocks. Unfortunately, the most egregious and longest lasting bug was during sequence 13, where I had two detection symbols on me at all times. Even through loading screens and desynchronizations, the symbols were there, and this lasted for upwards of half an hour. I can at least admit that eventually I just stopped noticing it, but geez man, it certainly wasn't the high point of my experience. Now I could go on talking about bugs in this game, but it just isn't worth it. Your experience may vary, but in this case, I saw more bugs in this game than Unity on day one. Finally, I want to talk about Ezio and the story of this game. I didn't enjoy Ezio as a character very much, and I didn't enjoy the story surrounding him. Now, of course, this portion of the video will be the most subjective, however, I still ask that you hear me out. Ezio is a Mary Sue. In this case, Gary Sue would be a more suitable term, but by my own definition and the definitions of friends, a Mary Sue slash Gary Stew is a fictional character who is so competent or perfect that it appears absurd, even in the context of the fictional setting. Literally from the first moment that you see Ezio as a little baby, he is held in the air as if to say, look at how special you'll be. He's blatantly told on multiple occasions that there is a prophecy surrounding a prophet who will change the world, and the creed literally tells him that he is the prophet and the chosen one. A prophet's arrival was foretold, and unbeknownst to us, here you are. Perhaps all along, you were the one we sought. Cosa? 
Now don't get me wrong, there are tons of protagonists that are special, but Ezio never makes a mistake. If he does make a mistake, he never suffers any consequences for them either. Every bad thing that happens to Ezio is a product of his environment or someone around him. His parents dying are a product of a Templar conspiracy against his family, and it was pure luck that he was able to evade the guards. Some have argued that Ezio made the mistake of giving the letter to Uberto, but how is that his fault? He didn't know Uberto was a Templar, and neither did Ezio's father. The only time Ezio genuinely gets bested is due to a brutal level of incompetence. When chasing down a Templar in sequence 12, he completely lets his guard down and somehow when he is delivering the final blow to this Templar, he does not notice a knife piercing his body until the entire blade is inside of him. This is the only time he suffers a consequence, and it's less of a consequence to the character, and more of a consequence to the player, since this action is what ignites sequence 13. And sequence 13 is easily the worst sequence in the game. It could be argued that Ezio messes up when he kills Vieira as he doesn't give him the proper respect, but again, there is no consequence to this. Sure, he suffers a huge consequence at the beginning of Brotherhood from not killing Rodrigo, but not only is that in a different game, but it's a consequence to an action that is portrayed as morally correct in this game. Another sign of a Gary Stew is when a character is perfect at everything. Ezio is immediately irresistible to every woman he meets, ranging from Christina at the beginning of the game to Katarina Sforza much later on. Even the courtesans are practically falling over themselves to get some, and it just feels like we're playing as the product of some fanfiction. Ezio is literally responsible for the latte. He just casually says he likes to have milk with his coffee, like, what? A little bitter if you ask me. Just seems lacking somehow. I don't know, have you considered adding sugar maybe? Or latte? I suppose it's something of an acquired taste. Where is Ezio's arc? It's clear that at the end of the game he is no longer trying to avenge his parents by killing Templars, but this is literally happening out of nowhere. At the end of sequence 13, he gives a speech about how you need to find your own truth and how letting vengeance consume you won't bring your family back. He then points to his friends as if to say they were responsible for guiding him to this realization. From what I've seen, Mario not only prevented Ezio from potentially fleeing the country, but sent him out on his quest for revenge by telling him about the Templars and about how they need to be stopped. Mario then proceeds to train him in the act of killing and even gives him further tools to kill people. Also, he could further his quest for vengeance. The Templars seek dominion over man, and we, the assassins, are sworn to stand against them. Was Uberto one of them? Yes. And the other names on my father's list. Templars as well. Paola teaches Ezio how to blend in and even shows that she too has been betrayed like Ezio, however, instead of passing on the knowledge of not to revel in vengeance, she instead gives him the abilities and skills needed to not only steal from people, but to further his quest. La Volpe doesn't really teach Ezio anything, as he just ends up showing Ezio where a Templar meaning is and informs him of some Templar plots. Machiavelli shows up right as you obtain the apple, and all he seems to do is tell you that you're the prophet. So I'm not necessarily sure where Ezio gets this revelation, but regardless, he throws it out the window when he tries to kill Rodrigo twice. He literally says, I thought, I thought I was beyond this, but I'm not. I've waited too long, lost too much. Requiescat in pace, you bastard. I don't think so. And then upon failing to finish the job, he then draws his sword and hopes to strike him down yet again, only for him to be stabbed again, at which point he finally decides that he won't kill Rodrigo. It made no sense for him to kill hundreds of soldiers and a large handful of Templar conspirators and figures only to stop at the leader. I'm gonna briefly mention another game because it baffled me that this game received criticism while Assassin's Creed 2 didn't. If you don't want spoilers for The Last of Us Part 2, then please skip to this point in the video. Ready? At the end of The Last of Us 2, Ellie, after killing hundreds of people on her quest to avenge her pseudo-family, stops at Abby because it won't change what happened to Joel. People were livid about this as it made the entire journey leading up to this point feel pointless. Regardless of how I feel about it, why is that criticism applied to The Last of Us Part 2 and not Assassin's Creed 2? Why does Ezio get a pass for essentially doing the same thing? The story itself has an awkward pacing as the time jumps in between sequences make each sequence feel weirdly disconnected. I understand that this and many other things can be explained through the ultimate plot device, the Animus, but it doesn't change the way these time jumps came across. So with that being said, those are my major reasons for not liking Assassin's Creed 2. I could bring up some smaller issues, but I don't want to dip into nitpick territory. 
I think Assassin's Creed 2 was an ambitious game and it was a huge improvement on the first game, however, just because a game is better than the previous entry does not make the game immune to criticism. I mean, isn't that the point of a sequel? To improve and expand upon the world, story, and gameplay mechanics of the previous game? In that sense, I think Assassin's Creed 2 succeeds in improving on the first Assassin's Creed, however, that doesn't change the major issues I have with the game. I want to clarify again that this is not meant to be an antagonistic video. If you like this game, I'm not saying you are wrong. I am just presenting a different perspective. If even after hearing these points you still like the game, awesome! I'll never talk down to someone or hate on someone for enjoying something, especially when it's as harmless as a video game. I don't think Assassin's Creed 2 is a bad game, however, it's just not my cup of tea. Again, I'm totally open to discussion, I'm open to having my mind changed. In fact, I'd like to have my mind changed. Liking things is so much more fun than not liking things, and that's why I'd like to keep my videos as positive as possible. It's just more fun to me that way. The reason I'm making this video is because upon saying that I didn't like the game on live streams and on Twitter, I was labeled as a contrarian and I felt it was necessary to clarify where I'm coming from without being restricted by 280 characters. I personally think it's fine if people do or don't like a video game. It's not hurting anyone, right? Anyways, I hope I made myself as clear as possible, and of course, I can further clarify any points in the comments section. If you've made it this far, then I'm grateful that you've heard my side of the argument and have given it a chance. I can get why you like this game so much, but for me, well... Let's just say I don't think I'll be hopping back into the Animus anytime soon. Hey guys, thank you so much for uh, making it to the end. I hope you're not too uh, angry at me for uh, for this opinion. Um, I just want to thank the patrons again: A B, Christopher, Cypress Husky, Frank Griff, Ghostly Gaming, Hutch Puppy, Lucas, Pyrite, Avery, Howdy Partner, Jacob, Tristan White Wolf, Tyler Medor, John, Denzel, and Ashwin. Really appreciate you guys for uh, for supporting me through these uh, these tough times, and uh, yeah, I'm now live streaming on YouTube, so I'm live streaming on this channel rather than Twitch. So I suggest you uh, come by and hang out. We have a pretty good time there. We're playing through Ghost of Tsushima right now, and it's uh, it's pretty fun. I also suggest you follow me on Twitter at that boy Aqua. You can always kind of keep keep up to date on there, and of course, if you want to see videos up to three days early, you can hit me up on Patreon. Um, I just wanted to say that this is the first video back since I have been hacked, and, uh, yeah, definitely a lot of stress has been taken off my shoulders. I appreciate your guys' support throughout all this, and, uh, if you're looking for more video essay stuff, feel free to check out Nam12399. He just released a full movie-length video on Persona 4, and it is really good. I highly suggest you check it out. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much all I got. The next video will be on Arkham Origins, and I'm basically going to go get started on that right away. I love you guys, and I'll see you guys next time. When the moon hits your eye like a bigger pizza pie, that's more.